Okay, uh, welcome back everybody to the Tag Heuer Drivers Club here at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. This, of course, is the place where all the VIPs, the drivers, the riders come to relax, talk to each other, swap stories, talk about the old times. And that's what we're going to do right now with Howden Ganley. Uh, we're going to talk to Howden about the early days at McLaren because right here at Goodwood, we have in front of us a lot of the history of McLaren. We've got the Can-Am cars here, we've got James Hunt's championship winning car, and behind the trees outside here, we've got all the very latest McLaren road cars. But I tell you what, Howden, when you got there, it was a very different story, wasn't it? Well, it was, yes. I, uh, I had a call from Bruce in about uh, June of 1964, and he said, I'm just going to expand my team, and I really want to hire Kiwis, and so would you like a job? Uh, at the time, I was working in the rubbish tip at Fulham, so uh, uh, anything was better than that. And uh, so I said, yeah, of course. So, well, okay, can you start Monday? Yes, of course. And uh, I turned up at the workshop in New Malden, and it was a small place, just enough room for two cars, a workbench, and a vice, and some welding bottles and a, a dirt floor had been concrete once but the earth moving machinery that occupied most of the building had broken it up so uh, it was pretty basic really when when bruce talked about expanding the team i think it was going from sort of two people to three people or something like that. yeah he had uh <laughs> wally wilmot who was for another kiwi who was his mechanic um very personal guy and then tyler alexander had come with timmy mayer but Sadly, Timmy was killed uh, in Australia. And the, but Bruce's thing was, he just bought the Xerox Special, uh, which he had to rename Cooper Oldsmobile because he was still number one at Cooper's. So <laughs> keep old Charlie happy. So it became a Cooper Oldsmobile. And uh, it still had the Tasman cars and was going to build another one of those. So the team was going from being strictly Tasman series with Cooper's to then building running a sports car and then building their own obviously he had in mind he would build his own sports car which he could do under the cooper regime because they would pretty much dropped out of sports cars by then yeah yeah H how was it that um howden ganley arrived in england in the first place how did uh, how did how did this occur uh, well uh when i was 14 years old i went to the new zealand grand prix sort of reluctantly my father took me and i saw grand prix cars 250f maserati 625 ferrari and I'd been going to be a, an admiral in the Navy, I figured. But, of course, uh, by the end of that day, I decided Grand Prix driver was a much better career path. And uh, so eventually I got enough money together to buy a Lotus 11, raced in New Zealand. And then the choice was, well, do I want to stay in New Zealand and be a big fish in a little pond? Or do I want to go and swim in the great big pond in England? So that was a pretty easy choice. My grandfather had died, left me just enough money for a one-way fare to England on a banana <laughs> boat, and so here I was. Looking back, though, those first few days at McLaren was the start of everything for you, wasn't it? I mean, in many ways, everything led from there, didn't it? Yes, it did. There'd been a couple of false starts where yeah. I'd uh, been the mechanic uh, with Germany and got the drive, and before that with Falcon got the drive, but it was always teams running out of money. Uh, I don't think I was the catalyst for them running out of money, but that's what happened. So, yes, it was. I had to sort of retreat, regroup, and then Bruce offered me that opportunity. And so, of course, yes, one of the most influential phone calls I've ever received was that one from Bruce saying, yeah, do you yeah. want to come and work for me as a mechanic? And then, of course, as you know, um, what uh, five years later, I got another phone call. Um, it's actually, it was less than that, uh, four years later. Um, would you like to come to Goodwood for a Formula One test? Yeah. And that really set things moving, yeah. In between times, though, you're, you're building cars and you're working on cars and you're getting your hands dirty and it, all this time are you still aiming, I'm going to be a Grand Prix driver? Absolutely, yeah. No, I, that, I could always see that up the road and there were a lot of twists and turns to get there because I had no money, I had no family money I mean my family were very comfortable but they weren't going to pay for any racing for me sure, sure. Uh, when I first said I was going racing 
uh, my parents said, well, yeah, that's very nice, but, you know, you're paying for it, don't look at us. So uh, I got used to the idea I had to find my own way of doing it. And uh, so Bruce then offered me a fantastic opportunity. Now, the first time I think, uh, the, well, I don't think I know, the first Formula One McLaren ran in the Monaco Grand Prix. That was its, that was its first outing. It wasn't altogether a great success, was it? Well, it obviously needs must, and at that time the new 3-litre formula was coming, so everyone had to find some sort of a 3-litre engine. A commentary Climax decided they weren't going down that road, so that took that source away. BRM were going to do the H16, but <laughs> I suppose it was expensive. And Bruce's connection with Ford led to him being able yeah. to get those Indy engines, yeah. and so that was the route that he decided to take. Um, Unfortunately, it wasn't even a very good Indy engine. Um, <laughs> and then when you turned it down into a 3-litre from a 4.2, it was even less good. <laughs> it was pretty bad. And it was so heavy. The chassis, designed by Robin Hurd, was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. It's probably the best handling car out there, the stiffest chassis. But it just had the doggiest engine in terms of horsepower. It made an incredible noise, but it didn't actually go anywhere, uh, which was a shame. But... The engine and gearbox and clutch and everything, I figure, must have been nearly as heavy as Jack Brabham's whole car. So <laughs> you were fighting a bit of an uphill battle there. So, yeah, uh, another thing that does please me is that I was one of the two mechanics yeah. on that car at that first ever race. Bruce qualified 10th. Coincidentally, 50 years down the road, Jensen I think, qualified 10th. or was Alonso at the last Monaco Grand Prix. But like bookends, isn't it? Um, and uh, unfortunately, we had the oil line come loose in '66, and that stopped its run. But but that was clearly where Bruce was going. And if you look at it, that we built the first McLaren M1 sports car in late '64. Eighteen months later, we're at Monaco with a Grand Prix yeah, yeah, car. Yeah, it was yeah. a huge upward absolutely run of it. Yeah, I, th I think. For our younger viewers, we should perhaps remind people that when we're talking about McLaren's first Formula One race, we're not talking about motorhomes and transporters and pit crews and pit and all of this. I mean, just give us a flavour of how you went Grand Prix racing in those very early days. Well, McLaren's did not have a transport at that time. Uh, they had a trailer and they had a big American estate car, Ford Fairlane, or the White Whale as it was known. And uh, so to go to Monaco for the first Grand Prix, we put the car on the trailer. We loaded all the spares in the back of the Fairlane and we filled up the whole back of the vehicle. And so as myself, I drove most of the way. John Muller, the other mechanic, and Robin Hurd, the designer, and the three of us went to Monaco. No, no motorways in those days. Uh, in, in the old Ford Fairlane. I wonder, I wonder if that weekend in Monaco made you even more passionate about getting out there as a driver, because Monaco is Monaco, isn't it? I mean, it's... Yes, well, when I was a kid, I bought that great uh, Clementowski Frostick book called uh, yeah. Circuits of Europe, Motor Racing Circuits of Europe, and so I'd studied the photos of Monaco, and then... We worked in a little shop down the waterfront that you've probably seen uh, Maserati used to operate out of there and then Rob Walker and then Bruce somehow edged Rob out and we took over. But we would tow the race car to the track, round to the pits and then back around the circuit when we were finished. So I was then, I remember driving down and joining down on the waterfront there and through the tunnel and down there and it was like the, the pictures in the book and yeah. here I was on the circuit <laughs> yeah, yeah. like I was only driving the Ford Fairlane towing yeah, yeah. and Bruce on the rope uh, with the race car so over the three days I did whatever it was three laps of Monaco in total and then when I got there in 69 racing in Formula 3 I knew the circuit yeah we must talk about this because uh, if we jump forward a little bit what what actually took McLaren forward by leaps and bounds was the success in Can-Am. Not only because of the success, but it brought money. And that, that, that changed McLaren quite a bit, didn't it? 
Yes, it did. I think it was a little bit of a struggle for them to have built the first car and then gone. And that was pre Can Am. So 64, late 64, and then through 65. Uh, and then the Can Am started, as you know, in 66. Yeah. But they were not winners immediately. Lola were the dominant yeah, yeah, make yeah. In, there in, in those times. But then McLaren's uh, designed a new car and got it all together and Denny came to drive yeah. and all of a sudden it was the orange steamroller yeah and they just steamrolled it everybody well, five years on the trot they won it yeah and if you look at it though it was all very well engineered sensibly done uh, they arrived at the first race ready to go and if you looked at some of the other te rival teams the American teams particularly they would only just make it you know not really ready to go McLaren's were straight out of the box yeah. and winning and winning and winning and because once you're winning your development happens isn't yeah, it because yeah. okay we're we're a second a lap quicker than anyone else but you know they're going to catch up but you've got another tweak to give you another half yeah, second yeah. and on it goes we we see this every year every decade every yeah. motor racing is always this way isn't it yes it's like it people is. think they're catching mercedes benz but yes. actually they're still a little jump Ahead. Yes, yeah. because they, they, the dominant guy takes yeah, he's already yeah. taken a step forward when you've taken the step to catch yeah. him up yeah. he's already <laughs> moved on to the next one yeah. Yeah. Because, we, because we don't have as long as we should have we have to jump around a bit um, at what point did you decide okay I've got to get racing I've got to get to being a Grand Prix driver I'm not doing any more building cars I'm you know how did, how did that occur well, I was building a Brabham up uh, at, in my garage at home at night and I would <laughs> borrow Brabham parts from Alan Rees at Winkleman Racing, take them to McLaren's at night when there was time because we worked a lot of evenings, and I would copy them. And Ron Toronek knew about it and he sold me a frame, chassis frame and a body, and then I made all the little bits and pieces. Um, and uh, eventually I decided that I needed to leave McLaren yeah. because I, I couldn't do all the night working. Yeah. I wasn't going to get my Brabham done. So I went to work for Lola, uh, and that wasn't really what suited me, uh, I found out after about a few days. So Peter Revson happened to come along when I was standing outside the Lola factory, sunning myself at lunchtime. Revson comes up the path to get some Ford spares because they were in the adjoining building. And he said, what are you doing here? And I said, mm. oh, I left McLaren. He said, oh, uh, yeah, how's it here? Not very good. Well, won't you come and work for me as a Can-Am mechanic? And that, he paid me American wages. And that, with the what I had done when McLaren seconded me to 40 year earlier, I mean, I could come back uh, early 67 by a brand new Formula 3 Brabham. So now I'm back racing. Did it... Most guys like you who want to be a Grand Prix driver you think you're the quickest driver in the world you must think that otherwise surely you wouldn't go into it so when you start getting in amongst the competition were you as quick as you thought you were um, probably not to start with I had a terrible habit of making good starts and then spinning on the first <laughs> or second lap and then clawing my way back through the field the upside was it taught me to overtake and be very aggressive and then eventually I smoothed it out and then I could afford better equipment because I was getting better starting money and better prize money. Um, but, you know, there's always... I know other guys say, no, I never had any doubts. I think perhaps I was, either I'm dumb or I'm, <laughs> maybe I'm smart enough to realise that I might not be the absolute best until I had that thing at Brands Hatch where I set the 100-mile-an-hour lap record. I'd previously beaten Emerson at Crystal yeah. Palace and uh, then I was so much quicker at Brands, and after that I wasn't afraid of anybody. Yeah, which is quite important actually, isn't very, it? Very, very important. You've got to yeah. believe in yourself, yeah. The thing, one of the things about uh, climbing the motor racing ladder is being in the right place at the right time. We all know this. Well, it's true of life as well, uh, but it's particularly important to have a good car if you want to be a consistent winner. No one's ever won loads of races in a bad car, have they? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> Even the, the best driver in the world struggle with the best. You can put on a good show in yeah. a doggy car, but you won't win for sure. So I was lucky again in Formula 3 that uh, 
I was going to buy a Brabham, but I got switched over through Rodney Bloor to a Chevron. It just happened that that was the best car of the year. Yeah. More difficult to drive, but knife edge, but ultimately quicker. And then when I could get the best Lucas engine and the really good YB11 tyres at last, then all of a sudden it seemed a heck of a lot easier. <laughs> yeah, it's funny that. Uh, yeah. I think most people, um, apart from later years when, when uh, with Tiger and, and Tim Schenken, I think most people think of you as a BRM driver. Would that be, would that be fair or would you th- object to that? No, well, that was my first uh, Formula One drive, yeah. and I was there for two years. Yeah. Uh, BRM were a pretty high-profile team, yeah, yeah, so yeah. naturally they think that. Uh, and, yeah, people perhaps didn't realise I went to Williams, one of my really clever moves, and it looked like the right thing to do at the time. Um, had a great offer from BRM, but I decided Frank was a better bet long-term. Didn't quite work out that way, and I, <laughs> certainly not Frank's fault, but... Um, like to think it wasn't mine either but he did okay in the end though well he did <laughs> that's uh, you know as i've said uh, in my autobiography in book, yeah. if i had the opportunity to drive for frank again i would in a flash but with one condition got to bring patrick head with you <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah. the book we're referring to is fantastic actually and I'll, I'll tell you about the book in just a few moments when, when we finish with howden let's just finish that that story because after BRM, how long did you hang on to that hope of kind of getting to the very top? Uh, well, oh, for some time, because it, as I said, going to Frank then, so I'm number one driver, yeah. and I think that my status is, is improved, and I really had high hopes for it. I went thinking I was taking Tony Southgate with me, but then Tony had a better offer from Shadow. Um, so that didn't work out quite so well from that point of view, but yeah. I still believed uh, that I could do it. Then, when that wasn't working, and I had another year of contract, but I then went to March, and that started well, but then all of a sudden there was the money, for, they didn't have enough money, they couldn't get the sponsorship, and then I had the fantastic offer from the Japanese. So, okay, here four cars, umpty ump engines, umpty ump mechanics, all the rest of it. And I remember saying, oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> and who's the number two driver? Ah, oh, no, Mr. Gannery, all for you. Number one driver. Too good to be true. And it was, but, you know, it looked good. So I'm still believing, yeah, I can do it. And I think, you know, I, maybe I'm a nutcase, but I, I still think I, if I'd had the right kit. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Why not? Absolutely. Possible. I just yeah. wasn't good at picking myself the right kit. Well, we could say that about a great many. We could even say that about Fernando Alonso, if you want to pick a modern example. He always seems to be in the wrong place at the right, wrong time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So some guys had the knack of being in the right place, and some guys are extremely good, like me, at being in the wrong place. And a bit the same in the sports cars, where I had that fantastic ability to snatch second place away from first place. Yeah. What you have, what you did do, though, was forge an extraordinary career. I mean, there's no doubt about that. Uh, and when you come to an event like this, w- almost everywhere you look, you've probably had a, well, it's a bit of an exaggeration, but a lot of places you look, you've had a kind of a hand in, in either putting it together or taking it to bits or making it faster or, you know. So when you look around, it must be a great feeling for a guy like you who's, can look back over what half a century more yeah it's um well the schoolboy dream from when i was 14 uh nearly came true but as you say uh okay i didn't win the world championship but i sure did get involved in a lot of really interesting yeah. stuff yeah. and i suppose as a result of my driving you know bruce mclaren said to me when he put me into the works formula 5000 one day you'll want to build your own car and I said, never in a million years. Oh, no, I won't. But, of course, he knew, having done it himself. And so I became a bit of a frustrated car designer when I was driving in Formula 1 because I used to say, well, if we just did that or we just <laughs> did that, it would be better. But designers don't always want the drivers to tell them. So then, of course, we started Tiger. And yeah, that yeah. was my outlet of being a frustrated car yeah, designer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, fortunately, well, it worked built, out pretty good. Built some great little cars. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah. Why don't we finish? Why don't we finish by talking of, about Bruce McLaren again? Because I mentioned at the beginning that there's a lot of McLaren cars here. What do you think he would think if he landed here today, and saw what's going on in those trees behind us, where all these new McLaren road cars are, and all the glitz and all the glamour and well, Bruce was a really far-seeing guy, and if you look where he came from, from his background and having that disability, and the fact that he got into Formula One, okay, a lot of help from Jack Brabham, but he was then able to carry on himself, and we've just talked about the fact that he started McLaren racing, really, the first car in 1964, 18 months later he's in Formula One, mm -hmm. uh, then they become dominant in Can-Am, then they become dominant in Indy, just after he was killed unfortunately yeah. um, and he he built the first road car and when they moved factory he kept the old factory on because he, that was going to be where they were going to build the road cars yeah. so Bruce had that vision and as you may have noticed he seemed to have all the big company executives car company yeah. executives in America eating out of his hand yeah. a fantastic personality greatest leader of men I've ever met yeah. uh, example to everybody so uh, I could see him arriving down here and saying, yeah, yeah, that's about how I saw it. <laughs> He'd have done it differently for sure, that's for sure, wouldn't he? Uh, well, yeah, he, he was very practical, you know, hands-on guy. Yeah. Uh, I should not say, you know, I mean, Ron's done a fantastic job keeping the company going and built on what it is. And yeah. to where in terms of Formula One, it's, I think it's the second most successful Formula One team after Ferrari and Ferrari had quite a head start on it um, but yeah Bruce would have built built an empire I believe yeah um, and of course it was cut short but uh, yeah. look at the thing what he set in motion uh, and even when he was killed if you go back pre-Ron that company on the day after his death it didn't even break step really I know did that's it. amazing it just yeah. kept right on going yeah. Which and that's a, a fantastic legacy that he'd set that in yeah. motion and everybody did everything for Bruce. I mean, there was nothing in that when I worked there. Whatever Bruce said, you know, that's what you got to do. Boy, yeah. I think you once said to me, if he told you we're going to march across the Sahara, you'd have marched across the Sahara. I believe so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, that's an exaggeration, of yeah, course. Yeah, but yeah. that's, as I said, he's the greatest leader of men. And... Most people, they came in and said, we're going to march across the Sahara Desert. And they get lost. <laughs> but uh, well, I'm sure we'd have said, yeah, OK, Bruce. Well, you know, if Bruce thinks that's what we should do, that's what we should do. Finally, Howden, if you can tell us about the book. and My book is called The Road to Monaco. And the reason is not my suggestion. Two of my friends in New Zealand, Michael Clark and the lady Ian Young, that everybody knew, fantastic yep. author, um, you know, there were various suggestions, and we decided that Cockpits and Climaxes was probably not an ideal title. So we moved on from there, and eventually the road to Monaco, and the logic of it is, I had to think about it for a while, but so as I said, I went there as the mechanic for McLaren's first ever thing. That was in 66. 69, I'm back racing in Formula 3. 71, I'm back in Formula 1, and then raced there subsequently, and then two years ago because I'm president of the Grand Prix Drivers Club we finished up at the palace with the uh, Serene yeah. Highnesses yeah. so that was my road to Monaco The Road to Monaco by Harden Gunley I really do recommend it not, not just because he's sitting here but seriously it's a fantastic story and I think you can gather from our conversation today there's, there's some laughs along the way as well thank you so much Harden I hope you're having a great time at Goodwood I'm having a great time at Goodwood. It has many, many memories for me. Uh, this is where I had my Formula One test, yeah. it's where I first drove the Formula 5000 car, yeah. where I had my first Formula Junior race. Yeah, it's just on and on. Goodwood comes into my life so many times. So it's absolutely wonderful to be back here at this event. Good. Nice words. Thank you. We'll be back later on with uh, more guests in the Tag Heuer Drivers Club here at the Festival of Speed. <laughs>